a, a group of uh, youngsters around. So you're all more experts. You're the experts. All right, how do I make this advance? There we go. So th I'm going to talk a little bit about the Arboretum, what everybody knows. It's a public garden and we are a historic <laughs> landscape. And what's our mission is connecting people plants and place. And so that's our job as guides, as tour leaders, is to connect the people who are letting us help to uh, share their time and help to manage their time, be stewards of the time that they offer us. We're helping them connect to this place and the plants here and make the connection between their place, wherever they're from, whatever they do, and uh, the plants that are in their community, in their house, and help give meaning to that. We're trying to add value to their visit by giving them a tour. And we get about 142,000, at least we used to, until recently, uh, visitors uh, uh, annually. And about 100,000 of them are general admission visitors, just coming in the gate, you know, the two o'clock tour on the weekend group. And, um, we get about another 8,000 who come in guided tours and the rest of them are classes and weddings and, and meetings and stuff. A big part of what we've done for many years is historic preservation. I know the fernery is a lot of, a lot of guides uh, favorite stops. It's in that top 10 of places people like to visit. The fernery was not open when I first came to the Arboretum. It was closed because of it wasn't safe to go inside it. And you can see that here where the, the structure of it when we were putting the new roof on and doing the restoration, we just had to replace all of that. And, and it had already been fixed once before. So uh, historic preservation is part of what we do but that also involves curation. It's making, making our place and the places that are old and have significance, making it significant to the visitor. How do you do that? You know, how to, uh, and the best way to do it is just share an experience. You go in the fern where you have a, people go, ooh, I, and they're amazed. You let them be amazed. And that's what the fernery is about, this transportive uh, ability. So when that environment really works its magic on visitors, you have succeeded. And all we're trying to do is facilitate that and add some layers to that for them. You know, I'm not gonna talk all about that. Yeah, education, we're, in it, we're a part of the University of Pennsylvania. We're an education institution. Uh, education and a research institution. And so what you do on a, on a daily basis as guides is absolutely at the heart of what the Arboretum exists to do, is to uh, help to teach people, help to connect people to make their lives uh, richer by letting them know uh, how wonderful plants are and letting them discover that. Another big part of the Arboretum is the living collection. And often we talk about that, the big tree tours or the old historic trees. Uh, this is that Katsura up above uh, Seven Arches. And I lined up these photographs, the one from the uh, 1923 and the other I took about two years ago and lined them up to, to uh, uh, just so you can see it grows. The Arboretum is always growing. We're a different place. So the trees and the landscape that the Morrises experienced or that maybe you experienced the first time you came to the Arboretum is not the same place. Geospatially, it might be, but trees grow, trees die. We plant things. It's always being enriched and enlivened. And most of the living collection, although we have our historic trees, most of them are uh, newer plants plants that have been a wild collected and put in the garden in the last 20 years. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice respect. Those trees have been watching the garden uh, a lot longer than any of us have living in this place. Horticulture display is a big one. And when I, I did the, the top 10 poll, poll of like people's favorite locations, one of, my, one of my selections for a place in the top 10, 
top tenfold was wherever the flowers are. You know, it's because people want to see color. They want to see beautiful things. So, and that's associated with color. And uh, so don't neglect to go off your path and just go where the colors look great and, and have, have people enjoy that. And, you know, talk about what's there as much as you can. Talk with the people uh, about what's, what's wonderful to see. This is in the, in the Pennock Walk, which is a hot spot too. So there you have a lot of environmental um, uh, issues you can, you can talk about. Research is a big part of what the Arboretum was founded to do. It's in our will and the university is a research and education institution. So um, we do, our research is about plants. Uh, some of it is about how to propagate plants that no one's ever propagated before. Um, and we, we have, we're this repository of germplasm. Um, I won't go too deep into it, but um, research is an important part of what we do. And how do we make that a message, you know, about the collections? The collection is certainly um, uh, a beautiful, they're gathered together for that purpose, but very often it's what you can't see, the genes in that plant that make it really important. Uh, like uh, in the, uh, the uh, Chinese hemlock, which has the resistance to woolly adelgid and feronia scale. Um, some of us remember when the Wissahickon was full of, in, on some slopes, was just full of, of uh, hemlocks or I remember hemlocks as being magnificent large trees and the birds that would flock to them. Well, they disappeared because of these diseases. What we've been able to do was we found uh, because of our collection of Asian hemlocks was so rich, was the most diverse. Uh, pollen was collected to be used in breeding to breed um, uh, hemlocks like, like the chestnut breeding program that are resistant by using those genes that are in the Chinese hemlock, which co-evolve with those pests and is resistant to it. So research is fun. Fundamentally, the Arboretum is a botanical garden. And this puts us in a tradition, goes back to Kublai Khan, if you want to do that, or Genghis Khan. And um, when there, in, there's a relationship between colonialism and empirism and botanic gardens because you were able to use the, uh, to bring back into one place uh, the wealth of other countries, which used to be plants. I mean, this is what, you know, before, pla think before plastics, you used plants for almost everything. Before pharmaceuticals, plants were your healing things. And so the early origins of the Morris Arboretum go back to uh, further than this, than the physic gardens, those medicinal gardens of medieval times. And the first university garden, botanic garden, it, that's still operational is the University of Pisa in, in Italy. And, and this is in the upper right-hand corner. Look at that parterre garden. It's a four part garden, like our rose garden. Um, and um, e each of them at the time uh, represented um, the, the four worlds, the, the continents that people knew about. You know, they didn't count Antarctica or the Arctic. They didn't know about Australia, you know, and the new world was really a new world. And this kind of blew things up. They said, all of a sudden now we have to make room for another continent and really, really, uh, uh, got folks excited. Uh, the plants coming from South America, North America, from the New World, one that, that there wasn't, wasn't room yet in their gardens. And they had to build greenhouses to, to uh, take care of these plants. And that involved new technologies. Um, the Botanic Garden was always closely related to uh, the practice of healing, the health and well-being. Because it didn't mean, it meant that in it, you could teach people about this is the plant that'll kill you if you take too much, but it'll help you if you take just enough. And so gardens were used for teaching 
how to use plants in healing and to identify those plants, to name those plants, uh, also to display them. And then later on, I mean, there's a vanity side of it, you know, just for the collection of it where people, you know, they would collect to show how knowledgeable they are. And, um, but that comes from the importance of plants in people's lives, agriculturally, as well as in, in, in medicine. There's a little picture of John Bartram's uh, seed house. So uh, you can have a lot of beautiful pictures of John Bartram's and they always show the, man they always show the mansion house because it's a really interesting building. Mm -hmm. But it's the seed house where things were happening. And, and it's from this seed house in the first botanic garden in North America, generally recognized. Um, this is where American plants would be sent <laughs> to Europe, to England, and to Europe to distribute the wealth of, uh, of the, the New World. And it was, Bartram had a lot of job, a lot of positions, but uh, this is what he's known for today. And when we think about the Morrises, well, this is in Philadelphia. The Morrises' ancestors were colleagues of Bartram's, not because they were plant collectors, but because they were part of the Quaker elite in early Philadelphia in the time of William Penn. Uh, there is, it is really easy to conjecture that um, the early Anthony Morris knew John Bartram. They probably met at meeting. They were um, um, both advisors you know, they were knowledgeable people, uh, and uh, uh, Bartram was a part of the time a, 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 a minister, a preacher, as was Anthony at his time. So they were, it, there's little doubt that they were in the same place at the same time, in the same societies, in the same uh, social structures, and would have known each other. Um, it's just an aside, but it, it gives you the, it gives you like when you talk about how long have the Morris has been here and where their wealth comes from, you have to go all the way back. You cannot just talk about one generation. It, you really have to talk about them all. Now, do any of you do genealogies? You know, have any of you on that? Yeah. 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 So you might recognize this structure. And what this is, if we look at the lower right hand corner, do I have a pointer thing? Oh, yes. Down here is Lydia Morris. What this uh, and John Morris and their two brothers who uh, passed away. This is the paternal mm -hmm. line going back to uh, the 1600s with Anthony Morris. And what I tried to do over time was uh, put together this, this family tree, like you know the family tree that's in uh, Widener in the McLean room? And you mm -hmm. can trace it. This is that tree, but just done sort of upside down. And just looking at the paternal line that goes to John and Lydia. And it's, it's, it's confusing to do their genealogy because you have Anthony Morris, Anthony Morris, Anthony Morris, Anthony Morris, Anthony Morris, until there wasn't Anthony Morris, but he got killed in the revolution. So his younger brother, uh, Samuel, that became the paternal line. And, then, and uh, then he also continued to have Anthony's, but we went down another line here, Isaac's. Uh, Anthony Morris, uh, the other thing that was confusing about them is there are an awful lot of Morrises and they kept using the same names over and over again. And look at this guy. Anthony Morris, who was the first uh, emigre to North America. So this is the Anthony Morris that came to, uh, 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 that came to, uh, um, first one to come here, uh, to Philadelphia, at the time of, uh, at the time of William Penn. He got here before William Penn, actually. And, uh, Look at this. He married Mary Jones, Agnes Baum, Mary Coddington, Elizabeth Watson, not all at the same time, but they, there were 15 children from that group. So this was, uh, this was pretty busy. He was uh, started, he was on the Supreme Court. He was a mayor. 
uh, lived on Front Street. There's still a little plaque you can find on a parking garage where his house was on uh, Front Street. Um, and uh, he was on the Supreme Court. So they were very active people. These earliest Morrises, uh, I'll go through that. Let me, let, me, let me get to that. I don't want to get too carried away. So we just go through the family tree and this is the Anthony Morris that's the Highlands, if you've been up to the Highlands. So he was a grand uncle, a great grand, grand uncle of uh, John and Lydia's. But, you know, it wasn't, uh, uh, it was different. So, all right, so let me see. Oh, see, I can't see what I'm showing you because I have this here. Let me get rid of this here. So. Uh, this is William Penn. This guy here is Gifford Pinchot. And I picked them both because they were like, as time, Gifford Pinchot was the governor of Pennsylvania during John and Lydia's time. And, and here's, uh, you know, uh, William Penn. So uh, fashions change a little bit. Uh, Gifford Pinchot started, is the father mm -hmm. of the Forest mm -hmm. Service. He started the, uh, the, 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 Pennsylvania Forestry Association that Lydia and John were members of. And, um, uh, but by that time, the, uh, the population and diversity of peoples in Philadelphia was so great that you no longer see Quaker political leadership. And that fell apart uh, because Quakers are pacifists. So you cannot you know, pay war taxes or be involved in the war or be involved in fighting, which made it really difficult to be in the state house when we're still fighting wars back and forth, the revolution and other, uh, and just, you know, power doesn't stay in one group, one cohort for long. But um, Gifford Pinchot is an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, character and, uh, and a person of the time. So what did the Morrises do? Um, they were in the Barbados and they were traveling, uh, Anthony Morris was traveling from London to the Barbados and, uh, and other ports back and forth. And, uh, uh, and they show up in this uh, map from about 1650 of the Barbados. This is the Morris, that little arrow here, this is the Morris plantation. So they were plantation owners as well as merchants. Now this is not a small deal. These islands were the most profitable, the most trafficked of all of the um, uh, English uh, possessions. And um, one of, uh, early on there was, it was, they were shipping all the plant products and food products and wood, but when the Dutch introduced uh, slavery into the area, everything went down a uh, more of a plant, more of a large plantation, and they they started the small plantation owners were being squeezed out economically and politically. You know there was a Dutch English war, and um, it, down here they favored they uh, favored Charles, uh, and that in the long term, that was the wrong side to be on politically. So the Quakers were quite persecuted. That persecution uh, affected the uh, economics of them being in uh, the Barbados. Plus, they wouldn't pay the war tax. And um, they wanted to educate their, uh, their slaves. And uh, no one else wanted that to be done. That was against the law. So. Eventually, they were forced out, and uh, this is, it's this change in the economics and politics of uh, the Barbados that uh, caused the Morrises to emigrate to the Philadelphia region and in, in North America. And this is where um, he meets his wife. His wife is on a neighboring plantation, and they get married and, and come, to, uh, come to the Delaware Valley. There we go. So when do they get here? They get here at a time of William Penn, a year before this. This is the, that sort of a, the Benjamin West painting uh, that's down in, in Paffa. Uh, you can see it, uh, the real thing. It's a great painting. And this is sort of apocryphal, but it's William Penn 
making his treaty under the elm tree with the Lenny Lenape, and um, they didn't have all these buildings. There were only 500 people, 500 Westerners in the Philadelphia region at the time, and many of them were still living quite, um, uh, quite small huts. Uh, and huts, not the right word, but uh, more primitive housing. And um, the William Penn Oak, uh, there's still a descendant of that outside College Hall. And we've been propagating that to uh, reintroduce the places. This is the Shack of Max and Elm, is what they call Penn Treaty Park, is where it was. And um, you can still visit there today. So if the early first set of Morrises were landowners, they took their wealth and what they did was they bought a lot of land and they went into various consortiums. So they bought their land from uh, William Penn and they subdivided and sold it. So they came here with some wealth based on their merchant history. But uh, you have to get into an industry sooner or later. Being in, in uh, shipping was good. But even better, well, I wouldn't say better, but more interesting is uh, to, be, to be in brewing, to run the brew house. So they were chartered to have one of the first public brew houses uh, as prior to the revolution in the colonial period. And it was right here on the docks. And this is it right there. This is a blow up of that. That's their house. This is the uh, oldest landscape painting of Philadelphia, 1720. And it shows you the fact that they maintain land and a dock, which made this useful for them, really puts them among the elite uh, landowners and industry. Uh, brewing, everybody drank beer. Uh, this was like part of the way, uh, water wasn't particularly safe to drink. Um, so, uh, and also it was a good source of carbohydrates uh, throughout the winter, but uh, <clears throat> you had to brew good beer. Uh, and what would happen is the ships always carried beer, and the sailors would drink beer on their voyage, and it was part of the ship's stores. And they would bring ale from England to Philadelphia. Well, that's, why not brew it here? Uh, so uh, they got into the business and they started brewing beer before they had barley in North America. The first barley crops uh, coincided with uh, Anthony's brew house business. So he not only had a brew house, he had a dock. So he, he was tied into the, uh, the merchant side of, of the business. It was uh, pretty good to be in. He was one of the only and the biggest. The city tavern, which was rebuilt downtown, and used to be the gathering place for Philadelphians, was one of the places that Morris supplied with beer. The meeting, this is where, you know, re revolution was planned among other things and people would sit around. Here's a home brewer. We had him do a workshop for us once locally. And uh, they're brew they're, before you had barley, how did you brew beer? Well, they used things like spruce and, uh, uh, you know, different roots that they, they would grind up. But barley made a real difference. And having hops, being able to grow hops in North America, that was even better yet. So uh, brewing was good. Here's George Washington's recipe for uh, beer that he brought back to Mount Vernon from Philadelphia. And uh, Ales of the Revolution, you can still taste them. The Yards has uh, equivalents that were based on old recipes. The other business they were in was uh, the iron business, exporting iron to England, who was, which was in the Industrial Revolution, was a really good business to be in. And so the, these are two of the first uh, furnaces in uh, Pennsylvania. And here the Colebrookdale, which is named after one in England, Anthony Morris is listed as one of the um, one of the, uh, the consortium, you would get a group of people who would invest together so that not one person had all of the risk. 
and he was one of the one of the the people. What did they do with the, the first blast furnace in Pennsylvania? They did things like fire bags. This is where you would make an impression in the sand. You would open up the furnace, and the um, and it would uh, you could uh, pour the, the molten steel would go would roll into these uh, these impressions, and and you you made them that way. Uh, the, the Durham furnace is another one that uh, Anthony Morris invested in. So there weren't many industries you could get into. You couldn't do manufacture because uh, Britain wouldn't allow that. But you could, you could get raw products and ship them. But raw products, the, the industry side of uh, iron was, uh, was uh, big on that. So this, is, um, so this is another source of their wealth. Uh, the beer went on for several generations, like at least four, four uh, generations were uh, involved with uh, the beer brewing. This is, this is the mansion, their mansion on uh, Second Street, which had the brewery behind it. And this is George Washington. You all recognize this probably crossing the Delaware famous. This boat that he's in is a Durham boat. And that has to do with the boats from the Durham foundry. There, there were shallow draft boats that could carry a heavy load, and that's how they transported the iron to Philadelphia, the pig iron to Philadelphia. So these were what Washington commandeered to cross the Delaware. Now, in his troop was Anthony Morris, and Anthony Morris was, uh, Colonel Anthony Morris, was part of his cavalry uh, his personal guard, and his personal guard uh, also served as the rear guard action in, in a fight, because then they could catch back up. So um, uh, they, I can't imagine putting a horse in a boat, crossing the river in winter, and then unloading on the other side. But uh, Anthony Morris lost his uh, life at the Battle of Princeton, and um, uh, he was one of those casualties, and he didn't have any children that survived. Uh, um, his brother Thomas uh, took over the brewery, and he moved he moved the brewery down to Dock and Pear Streets. And if you've been down to the Ritz on uh, the Ritz Five uh, down there, you've been to the site of uh, their. Um, this is the site of where their brewery was. It was it had an underground spring, which gave it clean, fresh water, and was one of the, the one of the, the bits. So Anthony Morris's brother, uh, Samuel Morris, um, <coughs> was their great grandfather was all, got in. He he was probably the one that started the industrial side of things. He invested in manufacturing, and they they manufactured um, the machines that in the uh, islands like ground sugar, sugar mills, they made sugar mills, they made, uh, they made other things. And his land was down where Passiuk is now, and that's where you have Tasker and Morris Street. That's named after the, the Tasker Morris Foundry, which was one of the, uh, the family, uh, uh, mil, uh, family steel family. He is their great grandfather. He married Rebecca Wister, and this is where uh, the Wister line connects up with the Morris line. Um, he never. He was known mostly as a gentleman. I can't really find much of his dealings. I think that he he did most of it through uh, people he hired. This is the Highlands where uh, their their grand uncle Anthony Morris is. Anthony Morris was an interesting character. Um, he, um, he was sent as a secret emissary to Spain uh, by, for, the, uh, for the president. But when he tried to get his bills paid, since he was a secret emissary, well, we don't have any record of you actually working for it. Said, no, I was a secret emissary. Well, I don't know. So that, that was led to loss of his fortune. And um, also, he's one of the another one of the family that got rid out of meeting because he was participated in um, uh, the whiskey rebellion. 
And he was on the putting down the risky rebellion side. Cedar Grove comes into the family through the Worcester and Pascal uh, family. And Cedar Grove, you know, it's, Lydia ends up giving it to the, um, uh, to uh, Fairmont Park. It gets, it's one of the houses managed by the art museum. And that's a great visit if you've never been there. And there you can see where John and Lydia grew up and where uh, it was when the railroads came through the property of Cedar Grove to get to the coal yards on the Delaware that they says, we can't live here anymore. And they bought the property in Compton that, that became the Morris Arboretum. Well, that's the original house and the rest of it was an, an addition to the house. Let me see where, oh, oh, oh there we go. So uh, here's another look at that kind of um, uh, back, uh, time timeline. So it's back with the Morrises, and this is the generations where uh, all these famous old Quaker names come together. And this is the Thompson side of the family, and then this is the Anthony, the Morris side of the family. They come together with John and Lydia's parents. Rebecca Thompson comes in. The Wisters and Sarah and um, um, Cedar Grove come in through the Paschal side of the family. So uh, you always say like Isaac, Paschal, Morris, you take your, your mother's uh, name uh, uh, would become your second name. That way they, they kept that, that line. So you can see the Paschal's following here and uh, Lydia Thompson Morris carrying that name on through. Uh, the Thompsons um, were uh, teachers uh, in England, and uh, John, uh, John Thompson, who came to uh, Philadelphia, was recruited there by a Abel James to be a teacher in the school for uh, colored children that they were, that they were, they were operating. I always thought, I always wondered where the name Compton came from. And for a while I thought it came from uh, the Bishop of Compton uh, because he had the first arboretum of North American plants in England. And then there's Comptonia, which is named after the Bishop. And um, he was also the Bishop of London. That was his appointment. But I find out that the Thompson family that these Thompson families were from Compton in England. And uh, it's from there that they emigrated to North America. Cedar Grove is, um, was a very formative experience uh, for, for, the, for those folks. They, um, this is where they grew up in the backyard. Uh, this is their backyard. And John's parents encouraged them to be horticultural. And um, there's a lot of stories we could tell just from this picture from the backyard. Uh, you know, the banana tree, there's a whole the history of the introduction of bananas. But the early design of the Arboretum was based in these Victorian kind of landscapes. Uh, John's father on, jo on, on John's 21st birthday gives him this copy of Rand's flowers uh, for the parlor and garden. So he was encouraged in that, in his uh, interest in horticulture as a youth. We finally get to the Morrises here, uh, the ironworks. This, this, old, this old map of uh, Philadelphia uh, shows where City Hall is today there were a series of buildings. It was Penn Square, but buildings got built on it. This is where the Morris Iron Works were, the IP Morris Works. They were building steam engines. And this was um, a famous ironwork uh, because it had the largest lathe, turning lathe, where they could make really large cylinders, which meant they could make really large machines, uh, pumps and engines, because they were based on steam. So you could hold a large volume of steam, you could hold a large water, you could generate a lot of power. 
Uh, this is that, if you've ever seen that little iron bowl in the woods, this is that iron bowl. It was a lid to a cylinder that was uh, used in a uh, water pump. Here's a picture of the Port Richmond Ironworks where John was, and it talks about all the stuff that they did. Uh, boilers, steam engines, hoisting engines, heavy machinery of all kind. This was, this is that same dock where the brewery used to be. So uh, what, uh, a little, little bit up the stream, uh, they, they had, they owned this, they owned this dock. And um, the Cramp Shipworks, which you see in the distance, bought their bought their uh, uh, their dock and all their um, uh, working, so that they could become more integrated with with the Cramp Shipworks. If you've been to Bookbinders, uh, right next door, you've been to where John's offices were. This cast iron facade in the building uh, next to Book. Uh, uh, because you had to be where the business was transacted, not down where the business actually took place. What did they do in the ironworks? Well, they made the pumps for the Schuylkill Waterworks. So uh, they helped put together the water system in Philadelphia. This is a picture of one of those uh, uh, engines, a uh, Coralis engine that uh, was in the waterworks. It was made by that by them. What else did they do? Here's a lighthouse off the coast of Louisiana that the uh, uh, Confederates uh, captured during the Civil War. <clears throat> this ex this stood until I think the 1930s. What else did they do? People often ask, well, did they get involved in the war and uh, the Civil War? And yeah, they had an opportunity. They made the engines for uh, for many of the ships that were built in Philadelphia for the Navy, including these two, the, this ironclad, uh, the Monad, Monadnock and the Tacone, uh, which were both involved in fighting. And it was for this reason that uh, Isaac was, uh, I.P. Morris, was uh, uh, read out of meeting. Uh, his defense was that I didn't actually make them it was the workers made them. I, you know, that was another part of the business. It didn't work. And they also made engines of uh, recovery. This is uh, one of the last engines they built, uh, fire engines, and it was just scrapped the, the year they moved into uh, to Compton. So, the Morrises um, were wealth really comes from this long history of things. And a little, the horticulture, you can see it goes back to, uh, you know, what were entertainments that uh, you were allowed to do as, as a Quaker. When the centennial came, uh, John exhibited this blast furnace. Uh, at the in the industrial hall, uh, this was quite a thing just to show. Here we have this industry, but while he was there, this is the fernery that was in horticultural hall. A whole section of it was just the fernery. John was on a committee within uh, the centennial. He was on the committee that you know, well, hosting the president when the president visited, visited, and that kind of thing. Stuff I think associated with the Union League. But he was also an exhibitor. And Charles Miller, who was the chief horticulturalist for Fairmont Park and for the uh, the centennial, was hired by John to lay out Compton. Uh, the, the private estate here. I love his mutton chops. And he was uh, trained to queue, Scotsman trained to queue. He had the Miller and Yates nursery in Mount Airy. <clears throat> Port Richmond Iron Works, when they sold it to the Cramp in the 1890s, the Cramp Shipworks, was a big operation. So this is a picture of their operation in Port Richmond. Their brand was so strong that uh, when that that they particularly for turbines uh, 
they held several patents on turbines. And this is the kind of thing that the Cramp Shipworks bought from them. They bought, you know, their patent rights as well. Niagara Falls, the turbines that generated electricity there, to, that was the huge demonstration of why alternating current was better than direct current. It were, they were turbines from the Morris, uh, IP Morris turbines that uh, powered that. And this brand held itself even through World War II. They were still being known as IP Morris turbines. Here's Philadelphia in 1886. And I need to see where folks are. All right, here we go. So uh, it was quite a different city. This is the Port Richmond. Hey, stop that. Where are we? This is the Port Richmond Ironworks down there in the red box. I'm trying to get my, uh, well, okay. Try, this is where my technology isn't catching up to me. Here's the Port Richmond Ironworks. This is about where Cedar Grove was. And then out here is where Compton is. Look at all these buildings. They're all short buildings. These are like, uh, this is the, the might of Philadelphia because elevators were just being developed. John Morris, when he was in charge of the insurance company, he didn't want to insure buildings with elevators because they weren't a proven technology yet. He was rather conservative in his views. All right, here's the interactive part. I gotta, I gotta, uh, I gotta stop and see who's awake. <laughs> I'm gonna unmute you all. You're all unmuted. Now, how do I get to see you again? Mass participants. I don't know. Okay, so I somehow I can't see you, but that's all right. Here's a question for you. This is this is uh, 1887, and I have a lot of lo some images here that help talk about that time. So um, <coughs> let's see. Who recognizes any of these people in there? Bingo. I do. Well, there's Queen Victoria up there in the right. Queen Victoria, because Queen Victoria was still the queen. And it was the Victorian time. And that's why this is the American Victorian era. Uh, Annie Oakley, uh, you know, was also active at this time and, and performed this year for uh, the queen. Van Gogh, is that Van Gogh? No. Yeah, Van, Gogh. Van Gogh, that's Van Gogh. Van Gogh was in Arles and he was painting his famous iris paintings at this time. So good pick. How about this? Uh, how about this other? Everyone has to have a mustache, apparently. So, so who is who is this guy, this other guy in the middle? I don't I can't know. Really get my cursor. Give us right. a hint. Can you give us a hint, Robert? Oh, okay. He's a president. I was going to say he looks like our president, but I don't know who it is. <laughs> it is a president. Um, is it Taft? No. Harding. No. Mm -hmm. Wilson. Cleveland. Cleveland, yes, Cleveland. you got that. Grover. You get a prize. So Grover Cleveland was the president. Grover Cleveland, um, in his inaugural address, um, described the uh, surplus in the treasury, which was like $57 million, down to the penny. I remember the end of it was 57 cents in his <laughs> report. So we were... Whatever Grover Cleveland did at that time, the, the U.S. was running a surplus. How about these two guys on the bottom? <laughs> You've got to recognize one of them, the one with the beer at least. No. Punxsutawney Phil. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, this is the year that Punxsutawney Phil made his debut. So he used to drink, Robert? Puxatana used to drink? I thought Everybody just... used to drink. He's drinking <laughs> beer there. Probably a Morris Ale, I would, I would guess. I would suspect. Yes, well, guy... I, was the only, I was looking for an old illustration of Punxsutawney Phil and, and a bow tie. And the other guys may be a little obscure, but this is Verdi. Who, uh, who debuted Aida at this time. So, you know, and the Morrises, the Morrises actually preferred, John was very fond of Wagner. 
Yeah. So uh, opera was opera. They were both members of the opera. We have still have Lydia's opera glasses in the archives. And then how about these guy, the guys on the lower right? Uh, actually, it says who they are. That's uh, Philadelphia yeah. Phillies, so in case you're missing yeah. baseball. I know I am. They finished the season with 16 consecutive wins. Mm -hmm. were, they uh, called the, were they called the Phillies then, Bob? They were or called were, the Phillies, yes. They were? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had, there, were two, there were two baseball teams in Philadelphia at that time, and these were the mm -hmm. Phillies. Now, the other things that was happening there is that this like machine there on, their, on the le left-hand side, this is the first demonstration that radio waves could be transported through the air and received. So like, where were we technolog technologically? We were just on the edge of radios. Telephones had just been invented. Um, and uh, up, up there we see this vehicle, this little vehicle that, in there, that three-wheel vehicle, is the first commercial retail automobile. It's a Benz, you know, like Mercedes Benz. And this debuted at the Paris Exposition for sale for the first time uh, retail, you know. And so the Morrises, when they move into Compton, are right on the cusp of the horse age and the horseless carriage age. So they came here in carriages and by train, but in the end, they're, you know, they're, uh, they're, dry, they're being driven around in vehicles. And what a watershed that is in America and in, in the world, that uh, transition to the automobile, to horsepower from horses. You know, and this is Compton. This is a nice view of the mansion, one that I like a lot, uh, when mm -hmm. it was just built. Uh, hats. Uh, you, of course, you all remember the great fashion that changed in 88 when earrings were out of fashion. I guess ears were, you were allowed to look at ears because you couldn't look at ankles. So earrings were out of fashion, but vulture feathers were in. I think they had killed off all the flamingos and egrets, and uh, so dyed vulture feathers were just the thing to be wearing. And uh, immigration in Philadelphia, Philadelphia was a large immigration center. This is the end of Market Street where it hits the river, and that's where people came in. This is where my grandfather came in. Uh, and uh, you went right to the train station, and you, you could be sent right off to Chicago. It was like Easy immigration. This was our, our um, this is, this is, Philadelphia was a huge uh, immigration port for Northern Europe, which provided all the, uh, the labor for uh, Philadelphia's uh, rise in, in industry. So we all passed that quiz, great. Where am I going, all right. So I need to know, well, um, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll stop now. I better stop now. I can't, I wish I could see, oh, maybe if I do this, I'm going to do this. This is a view that, well, well, here's an aerial view of the Arboretum. So you can see where the mansion was in relation to the uh, Rose Garden. <laughs> And you see down there, the fernery is just one building. There were a lot of buildings. So this was a palm house. This was a, <clears throat> a cut flower house, rose growing house. Uh, all these uh, vegetables and things. The, a chestnut tree had just come out here. Uh, this was kind of a colonial revival herb garden and another colonial revival kind of garden here. Uh, these were, there was asparagus and all sorts of things growing in here, cut flowers and some vegetables. These were currants. This is a good collection of currants. <clears throat> so uh, the Weeping Beach that many of you uh, talk about, the Weeping Beach is right there on the, on the yard. Uh, so, um, you know, they, there, no paths here. Look, no, pa no paths. And they end here. You loop back. You, if you went elsewhere, you would be driving or walking around. All right. Let uh, me, can I ask you something about the path that leads yeah, up me. and away from the house? 
Is that sort of like the path now? Well, this, the parking lot. Yeah, the one that the the one that the one that's like like starts up beside two lines. That's what this is. This is the path that goes up there, and then it used to go to the mansion right about here. Right, no, so I mean the one that comes from the house and goes off screen up top there. That's like going to gates or something. Oh, this one. Yeah, that's the driveway. That's where the driveway gate is. You know, like where there's that little piece of cinder? Little patch of cinder between the staff lot beside oh, the staff yeah. lot entrance. Oh, right, right, okay. Yeah, so this is Meadowbrook Avenue up here. This, this is the gate to Meadowbrook. All right, I want to escape. I want to escape. Oh, I'm escaped. Let me get down here. I want to see people. How can I see <laughs> people again? Oh, stop sharing. Stop, yeah, stop share screen. Stop sharing. Oh, <laughs> how many are awake? Oh, I see all the ones that are blocked out. They're taking snooze. Okay. That's right. So look, I, this is one of the, the hazards of uh, doing this kind of thing is I'm just gabbing on and I can't see people's reactions. So I don't see who's nodding off or who looks like they have a question. And, and plus, I, I, I don't have a, I didn't have a clock in view. <laughs> but my internal clock says, that's enough. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll continue this if you want to see more of this, you know, the next time around. And I can integrate, I can integrate the rest of it into uh, part two. Uh, well, that was really great, Bob. You were just a wealth of yeah. information. Yeah, it was wonderful. What, what what kind of uh, outside of the laudits and podits, uh, what were the, uh, let me see, are there any chats? Are there any chats? No chats, okay. And so what, 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 um, does anyone have any, any questions about this? Robert, I do. Yeah. Yes, Sarah. Yes. Um, uh, when you showed us the uh, sort of the genealogical slide with all the Anthony Morrises down there, I noticed the one that, that married all those times, the, one, yeah. the man who had four wives. One of his occupations was listed as cave dweller. Oh, yeah. Well, when he first, it's not an occupation, but it's when he came to Philadelphia, he came to Haddonfield first, and then to Philadelphia. Well, they didn't have a house, so what were they doing? They if people were living in caves in the bank. It's the, the the Delaware's relationship to was not like it is today. There was a bank, and there were terraces, and people lived. They just dug in there because you wanted to be near where the ships were, because that's you know where safety was. You got the river on one side, so they were cave dwellers. Some of the caves, I guess, were pretty fancy. But they wow. didn't have they didn't have brickworks. They didn't have the infrastructure uh, to build. They didn't have the saw work. So the early settlers uh, they they dug in. Okay. Wow. Interesting. And I, one more question, Robert. Um, John's two older brothers both died and relatively young. Yeah. Before, without issue, as they say, one got married. One died before he got married. If he you was know what they married. did, they die of accidents. Did they die of? No, they were illnesses. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were a lot of illnesses. Remember, John and Lydia before. Uh, not only did they later live through the flu, the uh, flu pandemic, but there were no antibiotics. Right, you couldn't. Okay. You know, just. Okay. People died, and that's what happened to a lot of those uh, a lot of those wives, were you know childbirth and and disease. Okay, thank you. So, so this what, is kind of off, this is kind of off topic, Bob. But have you read this book, American Eden, by Victoria Johnson? It's interesting. I saw her do a presentation, and it's about David Hasek, who was a physician. Oh yes! Oh yeah! He yeah, was a yeah. contemporary of Alexander Hamilton's. Right. And, um, right. He New talks York. about. She talks about the first one of the first botanical gardens in the United States was you, where um, where the um, 
Rockefeller Center is right now. Yeah. It's, it's really an interesting book, so I'm just mentioning that. Yeah, and I know the book. Contemporary of Hamilton, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hamilton of the Woodlands. Yeah, and he, um, he was one of the first doctors to dabble in um, herbal medicine. Mm. What else? So what's useful came out of it? Was this, first of all, very nice. Was this useful at all? Yes. 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 Absolutely. How, Absolutely. How so? <laughs> well, I was fascinated by the history, and um, I didn't know. I knew they were in the ironwork, ironworks, um, but I didn't know about the brewery, brewery and, and that history. And, um, and the connection with Barbados. And I mean, I think all that is mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah. For me, it was interesting, a lot about the Mars Arboretum, but it also brought up my uh, family because I, have, I am a descendant of Anthony Morris. Oh, really? So between that and um, uh, my mother's family had the Baldwin, Foundry, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. I never knew how the Parat Malting Company started. Yes, and yet as you explain on the little breweries, I'm like, this is a family genealogy that all the charts I have now make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the Parat Parats were was was cool because they were malters. Right. So, right. So if you're making beer, if you have the beer and the malters. And they, they formed a partnership uh, and, uh, and then they intermarried, you know, so it was, yes. so uh, that's how mm -hmm. they say that the Morris, the, 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 the Parat malting business was the oldest contiguous family business in the United States, Thanks. the longest <laughs> lasting, because they trace it all back through all the Morrises too. So it's, There's it's, a steam engine um, that they used that's in the uh, Smithsonian, but unfortunately, it's not out on the floor. It's back in one of their warehouses. Oh, oh. And as, as a kid, for a costume at one point, I wore a Peralt Malting Company sack. Oh, really? Great, great, great. Do you Which still I have it? I had it today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, you know, the train is interesting. The Rose Garden, think about the Rose Garden. The Rose Garden is dug into that hillside, right? Right. So one of the stories for which I have no real evidence, but one of the stories that was passed down to me somehow was, you know, the, where the Garden Railway is. And if you look at the Garden Railway, it's a, um, it's a tipple. It's a, it's a mound that comes, you know, that goes to where the seed are. So it's, it's, it's where spoiled dirt was dropped in a row and then leveled. And that's the soil from where the rose garden was. Mm. So, yeah, so you used that, and that was the edge of the property at that time. That was the, that was one, one, one side of the, uh, one side of the property. So um, that's where you would put your waste. Mm -hmm. There was a track, a train track laid and a train, little, tr little train that carried from the Rose Garden over to there to, to dump it. Now, why did that? This is the kind of stuff they had at the foundry. This is the kind of stuff they had at the ironworks. You know, mm -hmm. oh, they, they had track, you lay track, you move stuff around, you pick it up and and take the engine back. Not a huge engine, but like a, a small utility engine. So I always thought that was kind of, I kept looking for, for the rails, never found any rails though. Bob, the Highlands you referred to, that's the mansion off of 73, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never knew that, connect, that that had a connection with the Morrises. Yeah, and that is a, uh, that's a, it is so, Boy, they went into some hard times because it was the state, you know, it was a state-run historic site. Mm -hmm. But it's, it is, a, as a federal, as a, the building is really cool. Yeah. And the gardens used to be fabulous. Uh, 
uh, it's worth a visit at some time. It's too bad the barn is was converted to a house because the barn mm -hmm. would be more interesting. There yeah, I've been are, there. I just never, I just didn't know the connection with their great uncle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the other connection that is like on the side is Gates Hall, the Sinclairs, who were at the Highlands, also were involved with the Peppers who owned uh, Overlay, which is now Gates Hall. So the mantelpieces in Gates Hall are the mantelpieces that used to be in the Highlands before hi the Highlands was uh, updated in the 1850s with like stone faux marble mantelpieces. The wooden ones from the, 17th, from the 18th century are the mantelpieces in Highlands or, or at Gates Hall because um, Wilson Eyre was working for the Sinclairs and also working for the Peppers. Mm. So he says, well, I can use these in this building, um, um, uh, this house I'm building over in Chestnut Hill. Oh, sure, they're in the, you know, they're in the, they're in the shed, take them with you. <laughs> All right, mm. enough for now. So uh, I hope this worked out. If you if you have complaints, address them to Lisa or Eliza, and uh, <laughs> you can send them anonymously. If you have ways to improve this, let's do that. Because um, I don't know. Are we doing? We're doing something next Tuesday as well, right? What's yeah. next? Yeah, next Tuesday, what I'm doing is I asked I asked Liza, Lisa, to find out from from you folks what your what you thought the ten top tour spots are when you're given a tour of the arboretum. What what you know? What are the ten top? And then I compiled them together, and I'm just I'm gonna go through some of those spaces. Oh, and great! We'll go through together about how well. Why did you pick it? How did you how do you talk about it? That okay. kind of thing. Sounds I want to thank you very much. It was wonderful. You have a wealth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah well, thanks. Good. I make most of it up. <laughs> See, I appear to have a wealth of knowledge. That's, you know, that's all you need is the appearance, you know, because it's all theater. All right. Whoa, oh, oh. Sorry, sorry. All right. Thanks a lot. Oh. I got to go to the All right. All right. Uh, thank you. Thanks for volunteering. Thank you. It was great. All right, stay Thanks. safe. Bye. 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 Let's see. All right, so stop, stop recording. Oh, did I, was I supposed to push that or did you push that? Um, I didn't, I don't think that I can. So if you push stop recording, then